Let's start the show. Beautiful humans, welcome back to the I Like Birds podcast. I'm your host, Zach Rippey, and I'm so thankful that you're here today. This is one of the most special moments of our ministry and the history of our show. We have an expert in the mental health field coming on our podcast, who I just absolutely love their work. And I wanted to share a little bit about what we've been doing here on I Like Birds. We've been having amazing conversations with people and that have been really just uplifting the name of God and the name of Jesus, as well as just helping people both spiritually grow, mentally health, and emotionally grow. And this is why our guest coming on today is going to be so important for you to hear. All right. So if you've never been here before, do us a favor and smash that subscribe button. If the show is something that you feel you'll be interested in, if you enjoy this one, make sure you do that at the end of this one right, right here as well. And uh, man, we have a special sponsor that I'd like to thank for contributing to basically our whole ministry and our whole operation and just showing so much love in what they've been doing over this season as well as the month uh, prior to this one. It is Express Employment Professionals. We are located in the DFW and our guest actually has some ties to the DFW as well. And uh, Miss Sonia here will help you out if you're in need of a job of any sort or you need help finding talent. Make sure you go and check out the number that's on the screen and check out the link in the comments. Uh, we'll make sure to put her website up there if you're in need of a job or in need of help finding somebody for a job. So we appreciate her and we're thankful for that sponsor. And we'd love to just go ahead and dive into this episode with a very special guest. I present to you guys the moment you're all been waiting for, a mental health expert, uh, top of their class, two-time New York best-selling author, as well as the number one podcast for both health and fitness on Apple Podcasts. I welcome Dr. John Deloney. What's up, Zach? How we doing, brother? Hey, I'm doing amazing, John. Thank you so much for being here. You got it, man. John, I've been loving your book. It's called Building a Non-Anxious Life, and I feel like it's come at the perfect season for me. And uh, it's just really touched me. It's really just made me uh, face the fires in life as well as just uh, really uh, hone in on emotional health and uh, being mm. a better father, being a better husband, being a better man of God. It all kind of stands on biblical principles um, based on what I've been reading so far. So I'd love to talk to you about it, and I'm so happy you're here. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's a, it's just a beautiful day here in, in Nashville where I live. And so kids are healthy. Wife, wife likes me today. And so dude, we're, we're, we're doing great. That's amazing. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, we actually, my family just got back from Nashville. We went to a beautiful uh, spring break vacation. We were on the Piney River, if you're familiar with that, in Bon Aqua. We went to beautiful. Franklin and we uh, yeah. checked out the highbrow coffee spot and uh, the little pizza spot nearby. And we, it was just a beautiful night. There was fires going out there and it was just, a, it was an incredible journey. So I'm so grateful that you're out there. I feel like that's a kingdom thread in itself. That's awesome, man. Yeah, man. So when it comes to anxiety, man, you, you said something that was so profound. I even shared it on one of our previous episodes where you talked about it being an alarm system for your body. And these alarm systems can eventually turn into bad habits. So can you share with our audience what that means and how they can prevent themselves from happening to them and, and those bad habits from coming into their life because of the anxiety alarms? Yeah, um, I, I guess the uh, that was like that was a bunch of questions. So I'll, I'll try to answer them. I'll try to piece them together a little bit. So. I think we think of anxiety the way we're taught in our current culture is um, that anxiety is something that happens to us. We we get it, right? Or I have anxiety or I have some sort of anxiety disorder as though, A, we're broken, something's wrong with us, and it has to go be fixed. And as though anxiety is some external source that descends upon us, like a, like a blanket or like a hoodie. Mm -hmm. And this is not what anxiety is. Anxiety is just your body trying to get your attention. And so if you get in your car and you don't put your seatbelt on and it just starts beeping at you, I got this Toyota dude, it beeps at me so loud. It's so, it drives me crazy. And, um, cause I'm just like driving across the parking lot and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a Tundra too. Yes. It, the car's not broken. The car's doing exactly what they programmed it to do, which is to force me by psychosis to make sure my, <laughs> my seatbelt is plugged in. And so I can plug the seatbelt in. Or I can yell and scream and tr get online and try to figure out how to disable the alarm system. I could just I could just snap the seatbelt closed. And so thinking about anxiety as an alarm, and in the book I I use the analogy: it's just a smoke detector in your house. That's not the problem. Occasionally you'll be cooking something and you have a real sensitive smoke detector. Cool, you gotta get that go get that fixed with a doctor. Most of the time your your smoke detector is working pretty good. What's important is the fires that are in your life, whether that's bad relationships mm -hmm. or no relationships or 
um, you owe somebody a bunch of money, whether it's a bank or a car dealer or a family member, and um, or your calendar is too full or you are not facing reality as to whether you're about to lose your job or you don't have a job. All these things that our body's trying yeah. to get our attention. And in our culture, we've been told, dude, you live however you want to. Mm-hmm. You do whatever you feel like doing. Yeah. And um, if your body reacts by not letting you sleep, making you nervous or scared, having some physiological issues or some anxiousness, we got a pill for those things. You just keep doing whatever right. you want to do. And at some point, you got to pay the piper. So the book is just about what if you created a life that was based around peace and right. laughter and warmth mm, and come on. like like a life that you, when you open your eyes, were happy to be a part of, not yeah. one that you had to go take pills and run and hide from. And that was the purpose of the book. Wow. That's so good, man. I love that you say that. And it just shows like, I feel, as you said, identity, you kind of kept kind of speaking to me when you're talking about that. Do you feel that a lot of the culture right now is really honing in on these terms like, oh, that's my OCD or I have ADD. I can't do that. And oh, I, that's my anxiety and depression. They hold on to these like mental diagnosis as a way of um, maybe being the victim or getting sympathy or more, more so it's just kind of cool and trendy right now. What are your thoughts on that? Well, we have an identity free culture, meaning, um, We used to be bound together by a tribe, and we used to be bound together by a tribe that in some shape, form, or fashion worshipped somewhat of the same story, Mm. Um, Whether and that's all of human history, right? Whether it was multiple gods or many gods or, like, I'm a Christian guy, whether it's one god. Your tribe, the the people you lived around, your friends, family, and community, everybody was kind of in the same thing. And so your identity was in that tribe. Or if you were uh, had like a family lineage, like your great 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 grandfather fixed shoes, and then you fix shoes, and then your granddad fixed shoes, and right. we fix shoes in this shop forever. Um, I talked to a Romanian sociologist once. At, at, she was sitting by me at, during a, a science lecture, and she mentioned, "I will never understand the U.S.'s relationship to its soil." And I thought she was going to talk about you know poison in the soil, and she's like, "No, like." Like home ownership lineage, home staying in the same family goes back a thousand years in Romania. And she's like, you can't just go buy a house in Romania. You have to prove that you are, have Romanian lineage. And that idea is gone in our culture. We're yeah. untethered to anything. And so then you we got tethered to um, education. We get tethered to political groups. And what happens is they tell us who to hate. Right. They tell us who we're against, and we're so untethered. And so one of the tetherings, one of the ways our bodies are designed to be in community, we're trying to find community everywhere. It's, oh, I have a thing. Yeah. And the other Mm. problem in our culture is we are problem-centric. And what I mean by that is, dude, if if you and I just met each other like at a Starbucks in line, and I was like, hey, what's up, man? You doing all right? You, You would say something like, yeah, it's good, man. Like, it's cold out there. Hanging in work's there. Been t- work's been tough. I'm hanging in there. Everything is negative centric. Because if you said, if I said, hey, how are you doing? And you and you, re- you replied, dude, I'm doing amazing. I'm doing really great. My first thought would be, he's crazy. Yeah, right? It's like, 100%. there's something not right with that dude. So you have a culture designed around this idea of we were problem first. So we greet people with what's wrong with us. And we have people desperate for identity everywhere. And so they will grab it anywhere they can. And if it's a a constellation of um, behaviors that our body's trying to use to get our attention and somebody gives us a label, like you got generalized anxiety disorder, you got social phobia disorder, you got our social anxiety disorder, whatever Mm -hmm. it is, that's how we lead. That's how it becomes our identity. That becomes the badge we wear in the world. And if we take that off, then I have to be responsible for my actions. Then I got to be responsible for healing. And I got to be responsible for saying I'm sorry and for getting back up uh, and getting another job. And I got to be responsible for some things that hiding behind that identity allows me to bypass sometimes. Yeah. And I love that you talk. So like your book is really one of the, one of the, one of the ways to overcome this and live a non-anxious life. You, you share that community is so essential and you talk about how we've outsourced community 
And we've outsourced it to the point where we have Uber drivers in taking us to the airport rather than our friend taking us to the airport. We hire movers instead of having uh, asking somebody from our church to come help us because we don't want to inconvenience somebody on a Saturday. And that part really spoke to me because it was so much truth. And it was so like it was eye opening because number number one, you're making terrible financial decisions as soon as you're in a bind and have to go out of town for something. And then number two, it's like you're not able to rely on anybody. You're not having anybody you can call when you're in a pinch. You're not having anybody that you can. Hey, I'll get you some pizza come through and, and help me move. You know, you got a truck, like let's hang out for the day, but I need right, some hands. Right, right. So, like get a workout in. And I found a lot of value in that when I've done that in the past. And it's interesting though, you talk about the airport. I started feeling really convicted for it as far as uh, my brother-in-law, he gave me a ride to the airport in the morning, super early one day, really recently. And then uh, I was really grateful for it. He's like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll do anything to help out family. And it, it just shocked me. It's almost like it was transactional. I felt like I, if I do this for him, I have to help him with the greenhouse on our land. And I literally, yeah. I opened with that dude. And I was like, Oh, that's gross. Like, why did that happen? And your book has really been like a, an eye opening moment of like, no, that's it's okay. And then you also, I really felt convicted when he asked me to give him a ride to the airport, John, I felt like I owed him something because of the favor that he did for me. And he's like, bro, you don't owe me a favor. Like, it's okay. Like if you can't do it, cause I had previous obligations in those last minute. Yeah. And uh, it was just weird because I realized that, like, yo, I think I'm this social butterfly and I'm I'm somebody that has good friendships. But then when you really look at the meat and potatoes of my community and of my expectation of them, I felt like, wow, John John's book really is just helping me with that. It's powerful. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we, we have professionalized human interaction. Right. Like the idea that, that there has to be a committee of people who say hello at a church building, that should ring every alarm we have, that we have a sick culture. <laughs> <laughs> like a certain like, team to say hi. People are on the greeting <laughs> team. What? To say hi? Like, that's where we, I mean, that's, what are we doing? Dude, that's good. What are we doing? That's gold. And, and so, uh, it, I mean, it, it just, it, it just gets worse from there. I mean, it's, there's the hospitality committee and the food. Com- what are we doing? Yeah, man. Like, it's... man, we need a group of people to make some food. All right, we got you. Cause, cause we're in the same gang. I need, a, I need to ride. And, and, and also beneath all of that, dude, is this idea Man, we think we are such a burden to everybody. Yeah, we do. We don't think we're worth a ride to the airport. Mm. I don't want to bother my neighbor. I want to. I want them to like. I know how intrusive it is when somebody rings my doorbell trying to sell me like a you know like a home security system I don't need or want or magazines or something. And so I don't want to bother my neighbor asking for eggs. I'll just, dude. I'll just, I'll just Instacart them and see if I can have somebody bring them over. And. What I what I realized is there's a lot of psychological psychology literature talking about what a gift it is to help your neighbor to help mm-hmm. somebody. And so what I realized when I don't ask my neighbor for for hey can you help me like I live out in the woods on on some property too. And my driveway we just got crazy storms. My driveway is a gravel driveway and it gets these big washed yeah, out dude, tracks in it. Relatable. And my. Uh, my neighbor, he's 75 years old. He's got a tractor, and we have a pretty good arrangement. I give him eggs from my chickens and venison, and my wife makes this amazing homemade bread, and he comes and grades Ooh. my driveway. Ooh. And I tried to give him cash, and he was really – had his feelings hurt the first time he did it. I sent my son over with an envelope full of cash because I'd paid somebody a 1000 bucks to do that same job, to come yeah. grade the whole thing. And, re- and he's like – and he said this line. He said, hey, I'm your neighbor. Wow. He's a 75 year old farmer. And I was like, oh, man. Mm. And then we took him a basket of, of homemade pickles from my wife's garden and like bread and some of the venison from that I, I went hunting. He stopped his work. He put down all his tools, got all choked up, and gave me a hug. 75 year old farmer. And so I realized, oh, the, he values the time my family put into making this basket for him mm. and his family, provision. He don't want my paper money. You don't want cash. And it was this idea that I thought I was a burden to my neighbor. And in fact, by asking him for help, I'm giving him life. Now, of course, you can abuse that. You can take advantage of people and you can become codependent. That's what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about looking in the mirror and my first thought not being, I'm not even worth a couple of eggs. I'm not worth a cup of sugar. I'm just going to call. And we have to, we as a culture, we have to get over that because we are drowning from loneliness. Yeah. And you talk about that a lot. You even say we're outsourcing uh, we are outsourcing everything from from the point from the, even the greater decisions that we have to make in life. We're kind of relying on other people to define that for us, and we're we're struggling to the point where 
identities become like we're saying earlier about, you know, I have OCD, I have this. It's almost as if people don't want to seek out the peace that, that, um, that seems to happen. And we've lost, we, you said in your book, we've lost a definition of peace. So why is yeah. that? Why is our, we don't, we, don't, we don't even have it. Well, yeah. I think, I think we're living in an unprecedented time of, mm. and this is going to sound wild coming on the back of COVID and everything, but we have an unprecedented time of both constant war and yeah. being very disassociated from it. And so I've got my, I mean, I've got a lot of connections in the, in the military community. And so they've been at war for 20 years, but that hasn't hit the average U S citizen. Not like world war two did not like world war one did not like the Vietnam war did. Yeah. And so there's a media divide that's, that's really shielding us from all this going on. And so we're bebopping around life thinking everything's rosy and wonderful and great. Well, here's the deal. My granddad fought Nazis. He knew evil. And when he got out of the war, and again, I still don't, he was some kind of code break. I don't know exactly what he did. I know he, he wasn't an infantryman, but I know when he got home, he knew what peace was. And it was not that, right? Mm. We don't, we've lost that. We have no idea what peace is. And so instead of chasing stability, instead of chasing, um, instead of chasing joy, we chase happiness, and happiness is just cotton candy and fireworks and cocaine. We're just chasing the next good feeling, and all of a sudden, we've we've just good feelinged ourselves off a cliff, man. There's only so many donuts you can eat before your body goes, hey, I quit, man. You can't do that. And we just keep chasing it and chasing it and chasing it and chasing it because we're untethered to anything that makes any sense to our bodies. You said in your book, uh, when two or more are gathered, the anchor holds. And it's interesting mm-hmm. because a lot of our faith it looks as Jesus and what he did for us on the cross as the anchor of our faith in what we do. Do you feel that there's a, a hunger for, for God in the generation that is out there right now and they're looking for God in all the wrong places? Um, no, I, 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 yes and no. I think there is a desperation to be plugged into something bigger than yourself. Mm, that's good. And I think um, I think during COVID, what we accidentally did, um, and I think it's going to be a hundred year. We're going to it's going to cost us for a hundred years or more. Is we pulled in, in in an effort to pick sides and to fight and to politicize everything. Um, we accidentally pulled the thread because we all believed a little bit, kind of, sort of, mm-hmm. that at the end of the day, the government's trying to do the best they can for all of us. We thought that kind of, you know what I mean? We knew the government's crooked and government, but, but they're, they're, they were looking out for us. We also thought our doctors, like, yeah, you know, doctors, they like, they want us to be healthy. You know what? Schools are like, we want schools, like schools are working for kids, right? Churches. Yeah. Churches like have everybody's best interest. Well, dude, all of a sudden you pull a thread. Nobody trusts the government anymore. Whatever side you're on, nobody, nobody trusts it. Then everybody started saying, hey, the doctor's trying to kill us, or the doctor's not trying hard enough. And then when you pull the thread, those teachers are trying to kill those kids, or those kids are trying to kill those teachers by not wearing masks or whatever, or making them wear. And then the churches hooked their wagon to political one or the others, and all of a sudden they got lumped in with it. And now we got a mess because we have a culture that doesn't trust in anything. Wow. And that is a dangerous place for individuals to be. So I think innately, I talk about it in the book, whether you're an atheist or or a deep, passionate believer of Jesus or whatever, we have to understand that for thousands of years, all across the globe, the human body was designed to worship. We walk outside and look up at the sky and say, dear God, please rain because my kids will die if it doesn't. Hmm. And then the last 150 years, we got running water in our houses, and we think we're really fancy and smart. We got real arrogant. And I think we've realized, oh, dude, we don't know. And I've got a buddy's a neuro, like, <laughs> I sat down with some of these neuroscientists and cancer doctors. They don't know. They're working on it, and they, they're narrowing it down. They don't know. They don't know how this stuff works. And they've got ideas and hypotheses and theories, and they're able to look at some of the stuff with fMRIs. They're getting there. But I think everybody's tapping into... Uh, yeah, there's got to be a there's got to be a bigger narrative here, and we all everybody feels it. Everybody feels it when it comes for looking at God. They're all the wrong places. Um, I don't know that that's the case as much as there's not a map anymore mm. because previous generations they went to church, and what a lot of people got was a lot of shame. They got beat up a lot, and 
they saw their parents have pretty miserable lives and they're just like, I don't want that. Right. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want whatever is going on there. And I don't know that everywhere the church is offering, here's how to do life as a person of faith in this wild world. And that's been the church's job for all human history is to take yeah. care of widows and orphans and mm, amen. to take care of the least of these and to love teach neighbor. its people. Yeah. How to love your neighbor. And we've gotten away from that. We talk, it's either all like, let's talk about the Greek and the Hebrew, which is fine. Or let's talk about the political stuff. And I think people are burnt and they're like, man, I'm gonna go find it somewhere else. I did hear one guy, Zach say, and, and it stuck me. Um, he, we were chit chatting and he was a, some kind of sociology, something or other or something. And he said, hey, dude, uh, church has not gone away in the U.S. It's not declining. And this was not a person of faith. He said, they just don't meet at the church building anymore. They meet at the CrossFit gym. They meet at the at the bar class. They meet in yoga mm -hmm. class. They meet at the theater class. They're still wow. getting together and going hunting. Yeah. They just don't go to your buildings. Wow. And that was a big indictment. People will gather because that's how the human body is designed. That's scary, scary for the for, for the church, for believers, for all of us, that we have outsourced that. And I think wow. it's time to reclaim hospitality. You are welcome here. And I think that's where we start. It sounds like your mission is that. And are you leading people to that uh, with, with this year specifically, as far as like it being an intense year of, uh, you know, the chaos and carnage that the election year usually brings? Is that what you're <laughs> kind of guiding people to towards is just all of those principles that you speak of as far as community and just self-accountability and uh, facing the reality that's in and, and having the belief system that you have? Um, I don't know that I can force anybody to do anything. What I'm trying to, when I decided whether to take this job or not, um, I uh, I remember telling my wife, the world's chaotic, yeah. and I want to at least tell my kids that I, I got in the ring. There you and go. And I put the gloves on, I put the mouthpiece in, I give it a shot. That's amazing. And your old man might try to be a podcaster, a YouTuber, <laughs> whatever this job, to write books, and not may, nobody may watch them. Yeah. Um, but I want to at least be able to look at my kids and say I didn't hide when, yeah. it, when things got sideways. The second thing is, um, going back to your last question, I think people are desperate for a picture what does it look like? Yeah, exactly. What does it look like to be a dad who's like, I'm a six foot two, 200 pound Texas male. What does it look like to be a dad who is strong and tough and knows how to work and knows how to be a person of, of uh, like dignity? And also, I got to learn how to feel. Mm. And I got to learn how to keep my mouth shut. I got to learn how to say, I'm sorry. And will you forgive me? And I don't know. Can you help me? And my favorite words, I changed my mind. I used to believe this really strongly. And now I, I've got some new info and now I believe this. Um, we don't have a map for what that looks like. Or a mom who's, um, whose own mother either, either was just dis disappeared on her or was so critical of every step. And she wants to be different. She just doesn't have a roadmap for what that looks like. So we used to live in tribes, and if it wasn't us, we pointed at our, at our aunt, right? Our Aunt Debbie was awesome. Yeah. Our Uncle Bill, that guy was awesome. I want to be like him because my dad is a drunk or my dad doesn't show up. or my we, All that's gone now, and so yeah. we don't have anybody. And so I think what I hope to provide is, yeah. like, I'm a big, tall guy. Um, I got a lot of tattoos. I, <laughs> I, I listen to old punk rock music still. I, I want people to look and go, okay, I that guy... I, I know a guy that looks like him mm. and I want to provide a picture of like, that's what my, that's what my show is, is yeah. people call in with some really wild, tough things that are going on in their life. And I want to meet them with compassion and I want to meet them with, Hey, here's the next right step. And I want to give people a picture of here's what kindness actually looks like in real life. Here's what holding somebody accountable looks like. Here's when I get angry. Here's what that, here's what that looks like. Here's what, um, faithful anger looks like right and um here's what an apology i've done several apologies on my show when i blow a call or something yeah. uh, but i want i'm trying to just provide a picture a different outlet uh, or a different picture of here's another way to do life man and it's so much more peaceful than this chaos we're being sold right now absolutely man i love that and i love your heart for that and i always think that i always think that's why i consider you man a, a really big voice for the kingdom of god because you're leading people in a way that's uh, mentally been, making their lives better emotionally as well as just being somebody that's in their ear especially when you talk to me and or not talk to me but you talk to our audience in the book so me the reader about um the fact that people don't have somebody that they can call so they call your show to get this advice because they have that such lack of community 
And so have you always been this way? Because it seems like you're making such a big difference in people's lives now. Or did it stem from you kind of open up a little bit about the personal anxiety that you've struggled with and your childhood trauma of not, you know, having money and your hatred towards money because of that. So where did this all get birthed and how did you overcome that uh, to get to the place where you are today? I mean, I I don't I don't. um, I'll say it like this. I, I don't, I don't look at anxiety as something to overcome anymore. Mm. It's a natural, it's a thing my body tries to do to let, it's an important thing that my body does to let me know that I'm getting out of whack in a certain area of my life. Wow. And so what I want to do is try to create a life where, um, it rings not very often. Right. But, um, we got some, some data. I'll just give you a good example. We got some data a few weeks ago that, my show had entered into a sphere that I didn't understand it was capable of. It just got real big real fast. Right. And it freaked me out, Zach. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't, I'm an introvert. I'm a nerd, dude. I'd like to sit with my book out in the woods. Yeah, I like to go hunting and fishing. And I like to be with my kids and a couple of my buddies. Like, I don't, I don't understand all what's happening. I see your stories. I know <laughs> it, it's wild. Man. I just don't get it. Right. And so, but it, it tripped me out. It tripped me out and I got anxious and yeah. I started thinking, all the people and all this, and what if I say this, and what about this and all that? And man, I had to get back to my own, the own principles there. Yeah. And th- what I'm trying to pass along, dude, I didn't make up any of this stuff. None of this is original to me. Um, I want people to experience my friend, Randy, who sat with me for a year, my friend Slade, who sat with me for a year. We worked out together for a year. And I want people to experience my friends, Kevin and Michael, who I reach out and be like, hey, am I nuts on this? And they're like, yep. You're nuts, man. And I want people to experience my friend Todd and John who vote differently than me. They vote way the wrong way, by the way. And we <laughs> fight over issues. And dude, um, both of them are in my will. Like I oh. are helping, will help out when I die. They'll help my wife out, right? Because yeah. they're, they tr- like me and my wife trust them that much. And so all that to say is um, I want the world to experience that. And I want people to experience, um, Every single person, everybody is going through something and it's hard. Life is really hard. We bought into this nonsense that life is easy. And if you do it right, then you don't have any problems. That's not true. You build an unanxious life so that when you have problems, you can, you can absorb the blow, right? It's not to make a perfect life. And if you're a Christian, that's one of the guarantees Christ gives us. It's going to be miserable, right? If you follow me, you got to give up everything, and it's a tough ride. And so we want to follow, but we also want to ride the Cadillac, right? We want to both, <laughs> and it, that's not that's not the that's not the story. And so um, I want people to not owe anybody any money mm-hmm. because I want you to know what that's what that night of sleep is like. And it took me and my wife fifteen years. It's not something we just did, right? Wow, fifteen years. And I want people to know what it's like to. Um, Sit down every week with your wife and say, how can I love you this week? What's on our calendar? What can I take off so that I can show up for you? And I want people to know what it's like last night when I was at a punk rock show of old guys that were going back on tour that I used to listen to in high school. And I texted my wife from right outside the mosh pit. I texted her, thank you for every once in a while holding down the fort while I go wild out. And she said, thank you for loving me so much. Right. So, I mean, it's like. It's this, I want people to know what that is like. Yeah. And we just don't have that in our culture. And so, um, man, if, if someone can watch the show, pick up a little bit of, I want people to know what it's like to not have teenagers on cell phones. Right. hundred percent. To have teenagers whose minds are clear and whose teenagers are begging you to get their driver's license instead of like that's fallen off a map in the last five to 10 years. No kid wants to drive anymore because they just have their phones and their whole world. I want kids to know I can go on and on, but I just want people to know that piece, man. And we just don't know what that even is anymore. And so I want to provide a picture of that. So you say you were, um, you know, you, you script, you referenced scripture a few times. You said you're Christian. So what is your relationship with Jesus? Is that your source for getting the peace that you're able to preach? Do you use him as a, as a guide and a roadmap to map out your career and what you write? Do you feel the influence of God moving through you when you're um, crafting everything that you're doing as well as showing up to do what you do at such a big capacity every day? Um, I, I guess I would say it this way. Um, the great Rich Mullins, who is a songwriter, and a, I think he's a more of a theologian than a songwriter, but um, he wrote a lot of our the songs that we still sing today. 
He said, we so often over-spiritualize Jesus. And I remember that line really stuck with me. Mm. And so it caused me to go back and look at what is the guy doing all the time? And here's what that guy is doing. He's always with people. (laughs) He's always tired because he's helping. (laughs) He is always getting in front of people that the mob wants to come after, particularly sexual sin. Mm. He wants to protect people all the time. And then after he protects them, after he gives them a purpose, after he says, I see you and I love you, then he goes, hey, there's another way to do life. It's got peace. Wow. It's not the other. It's not the when you get it all together, then you can come kiss the bottom of my robe. That's not how he rolls. Yeah. And so, yes, when it comes to how do I model my life, um, everybody's welcome at the Deloney house. And I don't ever get mad. I just don't. Like, life's too short. I spent too many years doing MMA training, and those I got my head kicked in enough to where, like, it's not worth it. I, just, you know I mean, it's not worth it. Um, and I did too much uh, SWAT training with SWAT teams. Dude, I, I, I'm just not that tough. But the only time I get mad is when someone goes after the underdog. Right. When someone goes after the least of these. Then I get riled up. Yes, and so, too. yeah, when it comes to how do, is my life a roadmap? Yeah, he provides the, the the roadmap there. When it comes to career, no, um, I don't. I think you do the next right thing. And yeah. I don't think God promised me a bunch of money. I don't think God promised me fame and fortune and success. I don't think that's the promise. The promise is come what comes. Lean on lean on me. And I know that that's. There will be ebbs and flows in my life, and there will be seasons of up and seasons of down and Amen. seasons of blessing and seasons of of drought. And um, I've done enough work in crisis sitting with people who've lost everything, lost a child, lost their spouse, lost everything. And so my day will come when those things Amen. hit, and I hope it's not for a long, long time. But as my friend Dr. Richard Beck says, the person of faith needs to ask the question, who are you on your worst day? Wow. That's not right. your best day. What do you lean on? What what is what do you know to be true on your worst day? Yeah, and that's a guiding that's a guiding question for me. Absolutely, and um, I'll be honest with you, man. When I saw your content for the first time, probably like a year and some change ago, I was seeing you everywhere, you know. And then I was like, "Who's this guy?" And I tuned in, and um, honestly, I didn't like it because it was convicting. It was, hit, it was hitting me. It was hitting me, bro, to the point where I was like, man, like uh, I had I had to unfollow and then refollow once I got my, my my life together. You know what I mean? And it's not even together. It's more so like ready to face those fires. That's it. You know? Yeah. And, well, uh, and most most people don't know this. And I did. I, I, dude, when I took this job, I had zero social media. None. Zero. Not a Facebook account. Not an Instagram. I didn't know how that worked. I didn't know how that worked. Yeah. So I didn't realize how people experience social media on the receiving end. All those little black posts that I put, like little notes, those are (laughs) notes to myself. When I yell at my son and I'm ashamed, as like, dude, I'm supposed to be the guy. Don't yell at your kids, right? Those are notes to myself. When my daughter walked in and said, dad, 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 and I was trying to send a text or look up a funny YouTube clip or something, and I kept telling her, hold on, hold on. And I caught out of the corner of my eyes. She had dropped her shoulders, and she just slunked out of the room. Wow. And I pull out my mic and I'm sitting there typing something on my phone and I just typed, when a child walks into your room, put your phone down. They are worth more than this stupid little box, right? And so it's not me lecturing. It's me talking to myself. And I think people people read it as I'm lecturing them. And it's just me trying to say, dude. And so those are just little thoughts I have in my head that I put out, but no, no. Um, and I, bro, I appreciate I, you being with me. I love those. And like those <laughs> speak to me. I'm telling you, those are my favorite things that you post. Like the, obviously your show's amazing. Cause it's so like, you know, you can relate to people that call in from time to time, but the notes, bro, those are the vulnerable ones. Those are the ones where it's yeah. like, it cuts, you know, and especially the one you just posted the one you just shared which I'm so grateful. Thank the Lord for you sharing that on our show, bro. Cause that was one that was really like, I'm mindful now, especially when I get home. I'm in the business similar to you, where it's like my phone is going off constantly. I also do freelance writing, and it's like emails, social media, notifications, content. Everything is just constantly going. Even with the notifications tab off, it's still like people still constantly just coming your way, you know? So when I get home, I have to be intentional about plugging the phone in, and I'm a way better father. I'm a way better husband. I do a lot more. I complain a lot less, and I'm a lot more just focused on uh, focus on the Lord and how I should serve my family as those roles. So I love that you do those contents. It's, uh, I keep those coming. Those are amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Thanks, man. And so um, when it comes to another thing that you said, 
So this is a very vulnerable moment for me. I feel as if uh, a lot of the things I struggle with, you teach on very well. A lot of things I struggle with is um, emotionally not being able to handle my children's emotions. Ah, there you go. Yeah. And I tend to lash out. I'm not the person that I'm supposed to be when it comes to them. I, I lose grace. I lose forgiveness. I'm, I'm weak on mercy. I'm weak on understanding. I'm weak. I'm even weaker when it comes to communicating and giving, you wanna dig in? giving them you wanna dig in. Let's dig in, brother. Let's dig in. All right, tell, how old are your kids? So I have an 11 year old from a previous relationship who that hasn't been a, an issue with. It's more so been with my youngest one, uh, four years old and two years old. Okay. All right. So we're going to do like a miniature version of my show. Is that cool? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So, um, Give me an example of a time your son or daughter did something and you lashed out. So my uh, son yesterday um, or a couple of days ago, it was, it was this week, um, he essentially went to um, he wanted to watch Monster Trucks and play a Monster Trucks video game. Um, I went ahead and I put the remote higher so he couldn't get it after I told him no multiple times. And then he went to go get it and I ended up spanking him more, more hard than I wanted to more of like. I responded in anger rather than responding in discipline because I felt he was not listening. He was being disobedient. He was doing things that kids do at four years old. But instead of doing that, I spanked him and I felt mm -hmm. terrible about it. I was like, man, that's, that's, I was not good. And, um, you know, he ended up going, talking to his mom and, and he came back and said he was, he was sorry for not listening. And I, I apologize as well for, uh, spanking him like that. And then it was just like one of those things where it just feels like it's a, a frequent occurrence mm -hmm. with me and with him. And we've gotten way better over the years because it's been yeah. kind of an ongoing thing. Um, but so when, when you're a four year old, when you tell him to do something, mm -hmm. he doesn't do it. And in fact, he does the opposite. Forget him for a second. What is that? That's setting something off inside of you. What is that? I think a lot of it revolves around selfishness and wanting. No, nope, I don't think so. To go I don't my think so. way. No. No. Uh, my it's wife, deeper than that. My wife says that she thinks it stems from not being able to express my emotions as a child and being pushed uh -huh. away and told not to, you know, go in there and go in that arena or being isolated as um, a youth when those big emotions would come up. So when you got when you get big emotions as a kid, you got sent away. I was alone a lot in my room. Um, okay. I I feel that it's like these conver these emotions that my son is dealing with a lot of times when he either cries or when he whines or doesn't communicate well. It almost like like it just kind of really ruffles my feathers. I feel like the alarm is going off in my head. I don't know how to like I don't know how to help him. I don't know how to communicate, make things better. And it just seems like an ongoing issue with different realms of 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 life, whether it be a behavior issue, whether it be not listening, whether it even it just is. be him yeah. being tired. So. Often when our kids don't do what we say, it makes us feel powerless. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more terrifying, especially for a father, especially for a father trying to change his life, and especially for a father trying to do something different than he was given. Trying to give us something, kids, his kids something different than he was given. There's nothing more terrifying than being powerless. And all of us have different responses to feeling powerless. Some of us, my, my, I walk away. Hmm. I literally walk away. Some people yell. Some people hit. Um, some people just freak out. But it's that fear of being powerless. And I think you said it best. I don't know what to do to help. I don't know what to do to solve this problem. And I would challenge you to reimagine your kid crying as you are the solution. Like, he just wants to know, does daddy see me? Okay. I learned this from Dr. Becky Kennedy. She's a psychologist out of New York. And she said, simply looking at a kid when they're screaming, when they're flipping out and just saying, I hear you. And I believe what you're saying. I believe that you're that mad. And then here's the magic phrase. Your big feelings don't scare me. Hmm. And when you are, when you choose to be done, I would love to have you back in the room, man. I would love you to be back in the house. Does it work without you? Come yeah, on. For sure. He's the glue. <laughs> but there was that, there's that phrase of, I hear you and I see you. I believe you. I believe that hurt. I believe that you're that mad. And that doesn't scare me. I'm your dad. Yeah. And what that takes you from having to do is figure out and solve. And by the way, you're a comedian. What, what'd you do before you're a comedian? 
Uh, I was a in the police academy as well as um, a waiter. All right. My guess is you have a lifetime of finding the boundaries and pushing it. Absolutely. You wouldn't be in the position you're in right now. You wouldn't be in the ministry job. You wouldn't have been a comedian. You wouldn't have been co- like considering law enforcement as a like. That's who you are. And so, if you look at your kid, who you put the remote up here, and his body goes, "I bet I can get up there." He's me. And so instead of instead of seeing that as, <laughs> "Oh, that's me. That's my boy." Like, like, cool. I'm going to take the remote and put it in my pocket. Yeah. Okay. And most parents want to sit on the couch and go, don't do that. Well, then the four-year-old acts like a four-year-old and they do the thing and then we lose our minds. The parent has to get up and go get the re- controller or the remote or yeah. the piece of candy or whatever. We don't want them to have because we're parents. That's our job. And they're four, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and so maybe it's putting it in your pocket, but it's looking at it and going, oh, this guy's going to be a boundary pusher. He's yeah. going to be the guy that goes into an organization and goes, why are we doing it like this? Why don't we do it like this and make a million more dollars and help a whole bunch more people? And so I don't want to beat that out of my kid. I don't want that to remove that kid. And yeah. my kid has to learn that when dad says something, he means it, right? And I think most of us, if we were to back out with our kids and just think about having a boss, if our boss comes in and screams at us and says, you do this or you're fired, we'll do it. And we'll be on the first train out the door yeah. to a new job. But if a boss calls you in and says, hey, this is what my boss does. My boss, Dave Ramsey, pulls us in and says, hey, if you do this right, you're going to help somebody who's considering dying by suicide. Wow, you're going to help somebody meet Jesus. You're going to help somebody fix their family fortune that's been in a mess for a century. Wow. And, dude, I'll run through a brick wall for that mission, right? I'll do that all day. And so one of those is, hey, you are a part of this gang, this rippy gang. Let's go. And you can't talk to us like that. That's not who we are. That's different than I said, don't talk to me like that. You do what I say. One of those is an invitation to, hey, you're a part of this unit. You're a part of our gang and we are ride or die. We don't talk to each other like that. That's right. The other is I'm going to be, a, I'm going to throw a temper tantrum bigger than your temper tantrum just because I got big muscles. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But I think it's that sense of, hey, you're not powerless at all. You're not powerless. You are actually, um, trying to solve, you're trying to use algebra to solve a geometry problem. Wow, that's real. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah. The next time he cries, meet him. Okay. I Hold like his that. face in both sides of your hand and look him in the eye and say, I see you. And whatever he just said, I believe you. And then say, those big feelings, I'm not scared of them. I'm your dad. And I love you. Wow. When you're ready to join us, man, we would love to have you back. And then you walk away filled full, his shoulders drop, and he's like, oh, crap. Well, that doesn't work. I don't get dad's attention by breaking stuff. Maybe I can get dad's attention by, right? And now we're on to a different track. Yeah. Did you also reflect once on humor being something that you can use as a kind of a, a parenting mechanism to like break out of those those strong emotions as far as like... Yeah, I mean, humor is something... Um, I've, I've had some pretty sophisticated people who work in crisis listen to my show and they're like, yeah, we see what you're doing. There is a, um, I always try to keep a, a close watch on what I call the teeter totter. And when I'm talking to somebody who's really hurting, when it starts getting really, really deep, if it gets too deep, your body is, it goes into fight or flight. Right. And when you go to fight or flight, you're not listening. You're not learning. You're not, mm-hmm. you're not able to get any new direction. That's the same thing when you scare your kid. When you scare your kid, scream at your kid, yell at your kid, hit your kid, your kid's in fight or flight. They're not learning anything. They're trying to stay safe. And like, I don't want my kid to ever feel like they have to stay safe from me, right? They should, I should be the person they're hiding behind to stay safe from the world. And so um, I will use humor to smash the other side of that teeter totter. So if you, next time you listen to the show, you can hear me all talk to somebody and we'll get real hard and then I'll just start laughing. Or I'll make a joke about their boyfriend. And you got to do it delicately and carefully. I've just been doing it a long time. But it helps bring everything back up to the surface so they can get some air, right? And so, yeah, humor is a great way. But here's the deal. with My son, when he's upset, humor works really well. Yeah. My daughter, it actually pushes her further underwater. She feels like I'm laughing at her no matter no matter what. And um, so I don't, I don't use humor as much with her as I do. So, so you just have to know the person that's in front of you. But, yeah, humor can be really important. Wow. That's beautiful, man. And 
So I have to ask you, I really appreciate that. That really was helpful. I really feel like that's going to be something that um, it gave me a whole new definition of how to handle that situation practically, as well as just kind of being there for him. And I want him to be able to come to me for his emotions. I want him to be feel safe in his place of having these emotions. And this is a new thing. It's almost like I'm having to relearn how to parent and relearn. Of course how you are. To, yeah. yeah. And it's like, it's challenging. You know, you're trying to do it in the in a godly way. You're trying to do it in a way that uh, is it comes from the spirit rather than the flesh. Cause a lot of times that's what it is. It's, it's my needs not being met. It's, it's how do I feel about this? It's me. And I feel powerless. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes, 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 yes. So, wow. So thank you so much, John, for coming on this show, man. It means the world to me that you chose. I like birds to come do an interview on and um, man, your book, how is it doing? Tell me about what, what you've noticed, what has been the big takeaway from it um, and just everything exciting about it that you want to share with our audience today. Uh, I mean, it 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 so I mean, it did really well. It made the number one on the Wall Street Journal list. All that was cool. Um, I'm way more important than that kind of silliness. Is I, I get messages every single day, uh, every single day of my life. Um, somebody reaches out and says, "Hey, this book is really." Um, it's I wrote it for people who um, only read one or two books a year. Yeah. So I didn't read another. I didn't write another nerdy science book. I wrote a book that um, hopefully people could take with them. And um, I'm hearing like exercise groups, church groups, people all over are reading it together, and talking about, hey, how do we do these things in our lives? Yeah. And um, so, that's, dude, it's it's been really encouraging that way, and it's it's continuing to put food on the table, which is always good. Wow, that's beautiful, man. The power of a book, man. And I even wrote in one of my notes that I was going to ask you that, like, your role as a as a man of God, it's like some people that you're reaching. I mean, you're reaching millions of people, which is incredible. Millions of people. Uh, some of those people will never make their way into the Bible, but like you said, they'll be the, you'll be that one book that they read for that year. They'll never turn yeah. in, tune into a sermon, but they'll check out the, the Dr. John Deloney show. Right, and they may Google me, and they may stumble into this podcast right and then they may say oh that is a christian and then it, and, right and that, if they want to have that conversation with me I, I would love to and um i i just i always want to be cognizant of jesus doesn't tell people hey uh make sure that they are are understand the, the message of jesus christ and understand the message of the gospel and make sure they're saved and then take care of them he says do whatever you did to the least of these you did to me. Wow. They're going to know you by the love you have for each other. Give them a cup of water. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's like, I'll start there, man. And if they want to, if people want to go deeper then I'm, I'm, I mean, you, you could tell I talk too much anyway. I got to talk all day, but, uh, yeah, that's where I like to start. Where, where, where's somebody I can give them some water. Yeah. And I love that. And it's just, uh, Letting the Lord use you where where He has you, and being obedient and being willing to be sent. We have a hat that says "Send me" because we always, you know, want to be guided by the Lord. We want to be in His hands. We want to be able to have the one that is in front of us be the one that He calls us to minister. So we have like a slogan here called "Do it for the one," and it sounds like mm. you're living out that principle as well in your life I love right it. now. Yeah, good call, man. Well, I appreciate your hospitality, brother, and thanks for inviting me on. Thank you so much for being here, John. Uh, make sure, everybody, if you're listening, you go pick up John's book at the John Deloney website, which is at johndeloney.com. You can get it there. Is in, and then also check out his show, The Dr. John Deloney Show, uh, whenever you're driving around town or wherever you listen to your podcast. John, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Much love to you and your family out there in Tennessee. And thank you so much for uh, being a part of I Like Birds today. You too, Z-Rip. Have fun, brother. All I right, wish brother. you all the success, man. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch soon. I appreciate you so much. All right. All right. Have a good day. Wow, that was incredible. That was Dr. John Deloney on our program. We're just so blessed that he was here today. If you like this in this um, this podcast, man, do us a favor. You can go ahead and smash the subscribe button. We have some people listening from all over the DFW as well as people all over the world. So thank you so much for being here today if you've been with us. Uh, man, this is, a, this is a special episode. Uh, we have... Uh, we have, I'm just so blown away by that. That was just so incredible. Thank you, John, once again for being here for that, man. That was just so powerful. Uh, our next guest, we actually have somebody else coming also in the mental health space. We really feel like this is what the Lord is breathing right now in this season of life. It's going to be uh, named Trey Tucker. He's also on social media, just really helping provide people with really valuable content in their life to be able to just sow into what, um, what God has called him to do as well. 
And then we also have a live audience show coming up this Friday, which is tomorrow. So if you are watching live and you'd like to come to Fort Worth, Texas, I'll be with my pastor of Thread Church at this show. It's going to be incredible. There's going to be people that are be sharing uh, some incredible stories. We're going to be talking about the year of suddenlies that we experienced both as a church as well as in our personal lives. I'll share the testimony of my wife becoming pregnant uh, and also being healed as well as us having a baby girl and the whole testimony that comes along with that. It's going to be powerful. You're not going to want to miss that. And Pastor Alex uh, just planted his church and he's being planted by Mercy Culture of uh, Mercy Culture Church in Fort Worth. And it's going to be incredible to see that um, the, sh the testimony that he decides to share with us. I don't even know what it is. It's going to be powerful. And then we're going to have two guest speakers. We're going to have David Yuseta, uh, who is, uh, excuse me, we're going to have Mario. I gave away the, first, <laughs> the wrong one first. We're going to have Mario Cedillo, who's been a guest on our podcast two separate times, which is incredible. Uh, he's a, a fan of the show. He is also a supporter of the show, and he is also doing big things with created media. And then we're going to have my friend David Yuseta, who I mentioned earlier. He's a worship leader. He's also been on our podcast with Mario in the past, and he's going to be sharing a testimony as well. So that's going to be so fun. It's going to be so great to have these guys out. Taylor is actually coming uh, as well to help us out with the producing side of it, and we're going to be at the launch box, okay? You can get tickets to that show at our Eventbrite. It's the one of the first links in our bio, so make sure you do that, and that's going to be super helpful as far as um, just being able to support everything that we're doing as well as experience a night of joy and just big moves of God. And then what else we got going on, Taylor? Man, Taylor, what would you think of the episode, man, with John? Dude, that was, that was awesome. He's a good guy. He is a good guy, man. He gave such good practical advice uh, for people, and just his heart is like shining bright, man. For for what uh, what is what is called helping people, when it's called serving people. Oh yeah. What are your thoughts, people that watch the show? We got Mike in here. We got Aaron Ash. We got a few other listeners. What were your thoughts? Drop a comment. Let us know where you're listening from, as well as your thoughts on the show. We see Mike Garza, my friend, said there was powerful question, great questions, and uh, obviously people are getting touched by this one on the live stream. But man, uh, Taylor. What a show. That was that was so cool. Taylor, let's see you. We got the camera all set up now. Let's see you back oh, there. Goodness. Hey, hey there he is. Fiji water on deck. <laughs> yeah. Hold oh, side is it? This one. There you go. Look at that. Yeah. So Taylor, thank you for everything you did today to make this show so so possible with the, oh, with for the sure. new new tripod. We we appreciate you, man. This is a you got it. awesome setup and we ne would never be able to show some love to John Deloney and uh, our audience and even me, man. I got so touched by that. I feel like the Lord just truly blessed me right now. I'm like overcome with emotion about just like how to make a better change in life, you know, and how to just be better, you know, and just face the fires, do the right thing, seek out community, be honest, be vulnerable, be open, and um, and just do the the necessary changes. You know, he talks about in his book also that personal growth is so important, but it's not a a God. Don't make it your God and rely on God, you know, to to kind of pull you through that. And uh, that's something that we're going to be doing, really going to be focusing on. And especially with knowing that we have our next guest coming on, Trey Tucker, I also believe it's just going to be uh, even more just icing on the cake as far as what we're talking about today, as far as just, man, just getting right, you know, getting emotionally right, getting mentally right, and just getting even financially right. That's something we didn't dive into today, but a big part of the book actually uh, talks about him getting out of the debt situation that he's in. He was in into the place of like that once he once he started making strides to that, it's like when things started just really turning around. So make sure you get a copy of that book. And also, I want to give a special shout out to another one of our sponsors, man. This 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 company, man, is incredible. It is uh, MyFaithBase.com. They actually have been supporting us because they believe in what we're doing in the Christian content space. And we actually have a profile with them now. So we'll make sure to put that link in the comments for you in a, in a few min minutes. And you can go check it out because it's a great platform that, cre that, uh, that is intentional about connecting uh, Christian leaders with Christian believers. So in order to not be consuming a whole bunch of, you know, other things on the internet, you can go here and, and consume some Christian content from leaders uh, from all over the all over the globe. Honestly, there's some great content creators on there as well, and uh, we're blessed to be on there. So make sure you give them some love. And also thank you again so much for our sponsor, Express Employment Professionals. Uh, make sure you check them out as well uh, if you guys are in need for anything in the DFW that's local. And then, hey, if you enjoyed this one, this is our ask. If you enjoyed this one, do us a favor. Share it, man. Share the show. It's easy. You just got to press a link and post it on social media. You just got to press copy and paste in your group chat with your homies and your friends and your church fam. You just got to press copy and paste and DM it to somebody on Instagram. It is so simple to do. Please share the show. Help us get more people to hear the words of John Deloney and also eyes on this platform that God has been so gracious with this year with some big guests such as Ben Fuller, Troy Brewer, 
uh, Bishop Alan DiDio. We just had Roseanne Schwab from the prison missions we've been doing. And it's just been incredible what God has been doing. And then we're doing the live audience one with Alex Birkins. Like, come on. Big things are happening. So do us a favor. Share and subscribe to the show. Leave us a comment. Let us know that you shared it. Do it. Actually do it. If you're listening at another time and you're not listening on the live, do it too. Come on. Do it. Do it one time. Do it for the one. Do it for the one. Hey, hey, hey. All right. So, yeah, I told you we got we had some incredible guests. I'm going to leave it there. This was amazing. I don't want to keep this going too long, but definitely come to the live show. If you can, it'll be incredible. Uh, if not, catch us there. We'll be at 7 p.m. on Friday night at the launch box. You can get your tickets in uh, the link of our description. And if you're listening to this at another time, make sure you check out that episode when we drop it and be on the lookout for it. So appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Another big thank you to Dr. John Deloney. It was an absolute pleasure. And we'll see you on the next podcast of I Like Birds. Thank you so much. Like the show and see you next time. Cheers.